Well, how's how's it going, Pat? <laughs> Are you doing do it like this? Fall, uh, any <laughs> fall fundraising um, or fundraising? Any fall fun activities you've been up to? I like the yeah, you snuck work into it. Um, <laughs> I'm actually I'm doing something fun this weekend for like the first time in a very long time. I'm going. It's called When We Were Young. It's like a, oh, a music. Yeah, uh, I've heard festival. of that. It's like a yeah a repeat kind of on warp tour so it's going to be every band that i pretended i hated when i was like 11 and then like figured out that i liked in college <laughs> after like not worried about bullying so it's just like it's like paramore like green day or not green day um my chemical romance like avril lavigne bands like that uh all american rejects like all of those kind of bands coming together in vegas so i'm gonna go see that that's gonna be so fun it's gonna be great that's gonna be great I um, was trying to go see Paramore and I ended up in a Circa Survive crowd by accident and almost <laughs> out when I was 13. <laughs> My buddy got knocked the first time we went to one. It was called Revelation Generation. It was the only time I went. I had a buddy who just like wore all black was like screamo music. And I didn't even like it at the time, but I went. And afterwards I was like, this is the coolest music ever. <laughs> just like, you know, drum pedals the whole time. But he, yeah, he jumped into a mosh bed. We were like, 13 or whatever he got cracked got fully knocked out like immediately oh my gosh I was like, this is great we're like 11 minutes into it and he got absolutely lit up so that wasn't that that could have gone better for sure. <laughs> um so this is a little more low-key this is less yeah. you know yeah. screaming your face type music more just kind of angsty undeserved childhood rage which <laughs> I, I was big on from like 13 to 17 just being yeah. mad for no reason same same so as people file in, welcome to our <laughs> webinar on incorporating crypto into your end of year fundraising strategy. So we're getting started in just a minute here. I want to give everyone um, uh, some time to join, but um, our, our question that we started out with was, you know, what are you doing for fun this fall? Um, I just want to hear from you in the chat, you know, what, what are you up to this fall? So, um, Pat, it is always a pleasure to have you here. Um, before we dive into the webinar today, um, oh, do I not have chat set for everyone? I have to open that up. Let me do that. Okay. I think everyone can chat now. So chat us in. What are you doing for fun this fall? Um, welcome everyone to the webinar incorporating crypto into your end of year fundraising strategy. So uh, my name is Candice. I'll be your host for today. Um, I am the digital events manager at Community Boost and I'll tell you more about Community Boost in just a second here. So Community Boost is a digital marketing agency that exists to empower social ventures changing the world. We're really proud um, to work with about 400 nonprofit partners directly um, to help them generate um, our goal of $40 million in online donation revenue through the end of the year. Um, we're working with organizations like Charity Water, Souls for Souls, Cancer Research Institute, Habitat for Humanity. And we also love to do free educational um, webinars like this one. So we're really excited to have you here um, and um, want to keep you in the loop for all of our upcoming ones we're doing. Um, we also host the Nonprofit Marketing Summit, which is a big part of what I do, um, which we're also proud to say had about 440,000 registrants um, this year and more to come next year. We'll keep you in the loop. So um, for anyone that is interested, I want to get this out of the way right at the beginning. Um, if you are interested in learning more about Community Boost, you can book um, a free end of year game planning session with our team. So you can sit down with our team and we'll help you um, really implement and optimize your um, end of year fundraising strategies. So um, now, without further ado, I do want to get us started with our webinar today um, on crypto philanthropy. So um, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and we'll send out the recording to you on Monday. Um, we'll also send you a package of resources so um, and the slides if you're willing to share them, Pat, so that they can all take these learnings home with them. So um, as the webinar goes on, um, please engage in the chat 
And for any questions that you have, we are gonna be doing a Q&A. So put all of your questions in the Q&A pane. So um, Pat, it is amazing to have you here. Um, for those of you who don't know Pat, um, he's the co-founder of The Giving Block. And um, Pat has really built this incredible platform that makes accepting um, fundra fundraising cryptocurrencies really easy for nonprofits. So this way you are able to actually really easily accept donations with crypto. Um, Pat and his team developed the largest crypto giving platform for donors, raising over $100 million in crypto for nonprofits. So today the giving block is helping thousands of the leading charities, schools, healthcare systems, and faith-based nonprofit clients fundraise with crypto, including um, Save the Children, United Way, uh, Worldwide, and St. Jude's. So Pat, Thank you for being here today. And um, I'd love to just turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I will get my slides up, we'll dive right in. All right, let's roll. Um, so yeah, Candice did the, uh, the intro, but in short, we started the company in 2018 uh, as kind of a, a little consultancy that was helping uh, nonprofits like Save the Children grow their crypto fundraising outcomes. We were interested in crypto. We were trading it. I was working at a nonprofit at the time. Uh, and then through that, we found issues with kind of exchange accounts the nonprofits were using, started building out a tech stack. And then over the last four years, we're now at a little over 2,000 uh, nonprofits that we work with. Over that period, we've developed the main kind of crypto fundraising campaigns. We are the uh, creators and runners of Crypto Giving Tuesday with the Giving Tuesday Foundation. Uh, that community campaign is one of the biggest giving days, bag season, the end of year campaign, the crypto giving pledge, the companies and individuals take on the crypto side. And we're tasked with building a lot of the kind of giving rails between uh, nonprofits and crypto users. So if you look at crypto exchanges, NFT platforms, et cetera, they tend to come to us and use our APIs to build in um, baked in giving experiences. And then on the nonprofit side, we do most of the kind of crypto fundraising strategy, as well as a lot of the um, solutioning that nonprofits use to accept and, and convert their gifts. Okay, so today we're gonna do, uh, depending on everyone's uh, knowledge level, drop stuff in the, the chat, um, you know, in the Q&A throughout. If you have questions you wanna uh, cover and dig in on, everyone comes to this at, at different levels, but we'll start with an intro to crypto, uh, just some basics on like the ecosystem how it works. We'll then touch on crypto philanthropy, kind of why people give, uh, again, relatively briefly, we're then going to dig into the meat of the presentation um, and of your crypto fundraising, how it actually works, how to engage these folks, what's getting nonprofits who are so successful in this area uh, to build up those revenue channels. Um, we'll then touch on kind of the, the solutioning for acceptance and then hit on key takeaways, spend the rest of the time answering questions that you all might have. So in the... Um, in the chat also, as we dive into this, uh, if you can indicate whether or not you're currently accepting crypto, I'd love to expand your strategy if you're not already accepting it. Um, if the majority of folks are in one camp or the other, it helps as we dive into some of this to know how deep we need to go. So drop those in, take a look at that as we move on. Not yet, not yet, not yet, okay, sure. Okay. Accept it. Crypto is a mystery. We are. Okay, sweet. So it's a bit of a mix, which is expected. It looks like most people aren't. So um, we'll touch on at least at a, a high level, some of how it works, uh, and then try to, to balance as much as we can with the strategy piece. Um, but we always ask this just at the start, like do your organizations accept stock donations? The answer is generally speaking, Yes, they've taken a stock donation at least once before in the past. Um, we always use that as a point of reference uh, just because um, as we talk about what crypto is, uh, it has some of the same features of stocks. And as we'll get into it, um, a lot of the same tax incentives that, that cause people to give. Um, so in short, what is this? A lot of folks, you know, in the early days, they would call it, you know, vaporware. People would ask questions like it's not backed by anything, which used to be my perspective in kind of 2014, when I first had friends who were getting into it. Um, in short, the thing that actually backs cryptocurrency and why there's so much capital invested in it 
uh, is uh, blockchain technology, which people really over explain. In short, what it does, it makes it so you can't change transaction records uh, and you can't change the network um, that these transactions are occurring on. All that goes to say, something like a uh, Bitcoin, uh, the most popular cryptocurrency, it's been around for over a decade without a single transaction record ever having been changed. The bigger the network gets, the harder it is to change those transactions. Um, and you know, over more than a decade, not one successful transaction change. The reason people like that is if you work with banks or traditional financial ecosystems, you'll see just by Googling it that you know, they pay hundreds of billions of dollars in fines for cooking the books, saying money went somewhere when it didn't, uh, trying to move money from position A to position B, altering data on spreadsheets. Crypto uh, corrected that problem. So every Bitcoin transaction, if someone sent you a little Bitcoin today, you could check on a blockchain, which is public, uh, and walk it all the way back to its origin when it was first released onto the network. Um, no one's able to change those records, so it's a very valuable technology. You can 100% verifiably prove that you are holding something, that someone sent it to you, um, and no one can ever deny that or, or try to reclaim it. So it's, it's the most efficient and effective way to transfer assets undeniably. Um, and then what that also helps you do is provide an unchangeable supply. If you want to add that to your code, what that means with something like a Bitcoin is you can't make more of it. So with the US dollar, people are of course familiar with inflation. Um, it's built so that that can't occur. So you can't make any more Bitcoin. There's a set supply of 21 million units that get released over time. And people can participate in a financial system where you know there will never be a large injection of supply. And you know that if you're holding some or if you send it somewhere, it can never be denied that that is the case. Uh, so to be able to do that verifiably with code and have that be unchangeable is a valuable um, technology. And then people start using that across different types of assets. And that's what people invest in. So you don't need to know a ton about like the, the engineering, um, but it is good to know that it actually is a valuable innovation uh, rather than just something that people are speculating on kind of arbitrarily, which used to be my position on it. Uh, back to the stock question about whether you guys accept it. So like the largest brokerages in the US um, have tens of millions of users. It's a good point of context to know that the biggest crypto exchange for users uh, is Coinbase. They have, this is even old data at this point, but 103 million users, it's probably closer to 110, um, larger than any brokerage uh, in the US for stocks. So 300 million users worldwide. It's about the same number of users as something across the entire PayPal ecosystem. Um, so it's important for nonprofits to know there's a lot more people out there using it, uh, than they would have thought, you know, even three, four years ago. Then a highly active user, again, back to the speculation, uh, piece. Um, a lot of people are, uh, using cryptocurrency to do different things on the internet, not just kind of buying it on exchange and hoping the price goes up, uh, on Ethereum, for instance, where a lot of people create their own cryptocurrencies and mint them. Um, and then transacting things like NFTs. Uh, in 2021, there was more uh, payments volume on the Ethereum network than across the entire Visa ecosystem to the tune of $11.6 trillion. So not only are a lot of people kind of buying and holding this, um, but they're actually using it and putting it into use cases that are um, interesting and being actively participated in. And then people want to donate it which is cool. So this is the first year that this is just Google Trends. If you go to trends.google.com, you can search different search terms and see how many searches on the internet include one word or set of terms versus others. Um, and this is the first year that searches for Donate Bitcoin have reached parity for searches uh, related to donating stocks. Um, so that alone is just an interesting indicator. Some of that has to do with the fact that it's a younger user base who are just using the internet more often to begin with. Uh, but it also has to do with the explosive growth of the ecosystem. Even as the market has come down, the user base has continued to grow uh, substantially through the downturn. So more people are using it than ever. Um, and a lot of people continue to, to donate it. We have about 60% more donation volume this year versus last year, despite the market. So why are they giving it? Let's dig in. Um, so we just hit on this very briefly again throughout the presentation, please do drop questions. I, I can pause and poke in and out of stuff because we have a relatively intimate group here. Um, but in short, not everyone bought at the peak. So uh, crypto is down uh, more than 50%. At this point, somewhere between 60 and 70% probably from the all-time high. 
a lot of people who aren't active investors um, think that means, you know, investments are down overall, but that's not the case. It's just kind of like a, a loss aversion thing that people struggle with. The easiest way to explain it is if I give you a dollar and it goes to $10 and that cuts in half, you still have five times as much money. It doesn't feel good when you go from the 10 to the five, but that is still a good investment. Um, this is not investment advice. I'm not saying you should buy it or that it's overvalued, undervalued, et cetera. Um, all of that is just to say, if you bought Bitcoin, let's say two years ago, your investment is up a lot. If you bought it three years ago, your investment is up a lot. The further you go back, the more it's up. And you know, hundreds of millions of people have been buying it for quite some time. So uh, there are investments that were purchased last year that are down, but a lot of those users were buying crypto earlier than that. So the reason they're giving to nonprofits this year is they're not donating the investment they bought last year that is down. They're donating an investment they bought two years ago, which is up. Um, and there's tens of millions of people in the US as we speak where that is the case. They're holding some appreciated crypto from a purchase they've made at some point in time, which is why when nonprofits um, often look at this, they'll kind of pour in, uh, you know, our, our user base will grow at a higher percentage rate, usually during the um, uh, up markets, but our donation volume actually continues to increase through down markets, which nonprofits find surprising. This year is by far our highest donation volume. And that happens year over year, regardless, just as the user base continues to grow, again, because market volatility actually drives that giving behavior. So that's fun on the, on the finance side. Um, why are they giving away their crypto? Because people obviously hate losing crypto. It's their favorite thing to stack more of it. Um, the answer to that is a tax incentive. So if you've accepted stocks, you're familiar with this, but when you donate cash to a nonprofit, nonprofit gets the cash, uh, you get the write-off. When you donate a non-cash asset like stocks and crypto, nonprofit gets a million dollars, let's say, the transaction you're giving, but you also don't have to pay the state and federal capital gains tax on it. So with a million dollar gift, that could mean hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional tax savings. Uh, so nonprofits who are enabled to accept cryptocurrency stocks, et cetera, uh, give those donors a substantially uh, better giving option for their bottom line. And that tax incentive becomes more and more valuable the larger the gift size. Um, so anyone who's making a major transaction who's holding appreciated crypto or stocks will look at which thing is up more than the other, and they'll back down from there in terms of what they choose to give. Um, this is the largest driver in the U.S. on top of, of course, things like uh, generosity and crypto-specific fundraising initiatives. Um, I'm just going to keep poking into the chat throughout. What you're currently covering, is this why sometimes people will say crypto is high risk? Yes, absolutely. So. Um, that is the, uh, uh, the volatility argument. It's also why, for example, again, not like investment advice, but just like data on this. If you invest in uh, the stock market or any asset class, if you average in, they call it, where you buy a little bit over an extended period of time versus uh, putting all of your money in at any one point in time, those investors tend to outperform investors who are even trying to time dips and buy when it's low. The reason being over time, um, the market will go up and down and volatility. If you average your position over time, you tend to outperform it. Um, when the market is more volatile, that means it's even higher risk to buy all at once. So a lot of people will see the crypto has been going up for a while. They'll buy a lot all at once, like last year. And then when the market comes back from a correction, if you just buy when people are buying it in a big mad dash, then you can, of course, time kind of the top of a bubble and then get really crushed. Um, so explosive upward and downward movements over time actually means investors will do better if they're kind of consistent and unemotional. Um, but it's also the same reason why some people will kind of, they call it FOMO, you know, fear of missing out, uh, try to buy all at once when the market is up. So like right now you're probably, if you're on this call, not knocking anyone individually, but you're probably not making investments when you're uh, worried about the market being bad, but generally institutional capital will actually buy more things when markets come down. Uh, and then when the market's been going up for a while, people will kind of exit positions or um, at least just try to keep buying that same average amount over time versus uh, some people will buy all at once. So yes, it, it's riskier in the sense that if you buy a lot all at once, there's a much higher risk of the larger downward movement, but you also have the upside of the, the, the upward movement. So yeah, I'm saying the same thing five different ways, but yes, that's why they call it high risk. Um, and please, yeah, keep asking questions throughout whatever you guys want to cover. 
Um, who are these people? They tend to be uh, millennials and Gen Zs. 94% of them are super young. However, more than half of crypto wealth is actually held uh, by baby boomers and Gen X and institutional money. So like a, a stat that I think is cool is 95% of hedge funds either have crypto or actively diversifying into it. Um, because older folks have so much money, a very small portfolio diversification into crypto can mean a much larger share, right? You could be a millennial who's you know, making $90,000 a year, you're putting little off your paycheck on a weekly basis, um, and you just won't outperform someone who's got $100 million sitting in a bank account if they just put 1% of their money in all at once, they can obviously see uh, outrageously higher returns on that. So uh, despite the fact that yes, millennials and Gen Zs are kind of the active target, that nonprofits are looking at some of our biggest donations ever. When you talk about like a seven, uh, eight figure type crypto transaction, um, they oftentimes are coming from, you know, hedge fund managers or, or older institutional money who bought into some crypto at some point in time and then have seen this explosive uh, performance of it. Um, so yeah, and then 83% of millennial millionaires, this is now maybe like a year and a half old, that statistic. Uh, have crypto. So that's their, the, the way that they're investing over time. Great wealth transfer is a great point of reference. If this is a way that people who are young and high net worth are investing, then over time as they take on more of the capital from their parents uh, and other folks in their family, a higher proportion of which uh, should be expected to be moving into crypto, which should lead to good market performance. Again, not investment advice at all. Things change all the time. One crypto can lose all of a sudden. Maybe someone invents a really great one, it crushes the others. You always want to be careful, but the technology itself and the way that these folks are investing is a good indicator. Um, and one of the reasons why like a lot of our blue chip nonprofits in particular view crypto as the number one strategy for uh, future-proofing their, their major gifts program. Yeah, and then they're high value donors as a result. So just from left to right, the Fidelity report, we actually uh, picked up Mike McLean, who built the crypto program at Fidelity Charitable. He now runs our institutional arm. They did a report last year, which was really cool, asking the investors on the platform, how generous are you? You know, How likely are you to donate $1,000 or more to charity? Folks who tick the crypto box, saying that they invest in crypto as one of their modes of investment, were 36% more likely to donate $1,000 or more to charity than people who invested in stocks alone. Um, some of that, of course, has to do with market performance, but considering these investors are generally significantly younger, it's a great indicator if you're trying to invest in a younger donor demographic that can pay off now and also obviously have higher giving capacity as they age uh, and meet their uh, peak earning years. Young, again, we touched on late 20s, early 30s is still kind of an average age for a crypto user. Um, that's also why schools, oftentimes we have an um, integration partner, Give Campus. Um, who we're exclusive with on the EDU side. Um, schools are graduating class of people every year who are more and more likely to be crypto investors. Wealthy, the average income of a crypto user is higher than every uh, other city in America. So even more than Silicon Valley, if you took all the crypto users in the States, you put them in one place, it would be the wealthiest city in the country, uh, despite, again, how young they are. And the result of that is last year, an average donation size of $10,500. We haven't calculated our average this year yet because so much becomes at end of year. Um, but that's relatively normal. The idea of a um, you know low five figure transaction being kind of the standard gift size as a, a tax offset move um, is pretty normal, despite the fact that a lot of these folks are quite young. And then who fundraises crypto? So some of the folks on here were saying they already accept it, some folks aren't. We always show this slide. Uh, despite the fact that like the vast majority of the 2000 groups we work with are small and mid-sized, we always show like a bunch of the blue chips, a lot of significant universities, um, hospital systems, big blue chip charities, faith-based organizations, et cetera, uh, are doing it and have been doing so for quite some time, accepting crypto and actively fundraising it. It, it again tends to be for a large nonprofit, especially as resources, kind of their, their number one strategy for future proofing. A major gifts program. So sometimes people will say, okay, we're, we're very uh, early into crypto. So we just like to remind folks, you know, it's been, been around for a little over a decade and uh, there are a good number of nonprofits now with, with six figure crypto revenue channels and then a, a decent number with, with seven figure plus. 
So it's it's a very established uh, thing at this point. We've only been doing it for four years, but it feels like closer to a decade. Um, where is this going? Number one barrier to the growth in this area is, for instance, there was like a little over, at least from what we could calculate and see publicly, $400 million or so donating crypto last year. We should see significantly more this year. There's no reason it shouldn't be billions of dollars. Um, the only reason it isn't is because these people are in our, our best guesstimate. It's because they're young, but the, the tax literacy issue is the biggest thing. People love crypto. Um, when they're into it, you've probably had someone ruin Thanksgiving by talking about it too much. Um, but because they love it and because they're culturally uh, used to kind of holding on to it at all costs, riding through that volatility we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, um, not all of them uh, are familiar with any opportunities to give it away. And because they're young, they're probably not working with financial advisors. They're not as plugged into some of these maneuvers that some older donors might so as they get older, we're trying to do a lot of this education. Our nonprofits, even while they fundraise, do tax education constantly because they meet all these crypto users who go, oh, you take crypto, cool. Um, but I don't want to give that away. And then they'll give 20 bucks with a credit card sometimes. Teaching these younger folks about this tax arbitrage move is, is super important. If everyone behaved just rationally and understood the tax incentive, there should be billions of dollars a year in crypto giving. Uh, and then the other piece is the great wealth transfer still Again, 94% of these users are millennials and Gen Zs as that wealth transfer occurs and the capital goes into those hands. Um, the vast, vast majority of those folks are crypto investors. We should see this becoming a much more normalized donation method because it's normalized for them already. Um, and then as they become your major gift base, then this is their most tax incentivized load of non-cash. Uh, those two things align and we should see continued kind of explosive growth in the sector if that occurs. Uh, what percent of annual revenue does cryptocurrency account for, uh, for nonprofits? It's a really good question. We'll, we'll touch on this as we talk about the active fundraising. Um, the biggest issue with it is a lot of nonprofits who accept crypto, who aren't uh, working with us at the giving block, uh, are just accepting it. So they'll add it as a donation method. They don't treat it as a donor demographic. So in short, like if you just add a way for people to give you crypto on your website, but you never try to target crypto users or steward them differently, or you know, you're not involving yourself in crypto fundraising campaigns or like a crypto pledge, partnerships, NFT drop, whatever stuff you want. There's obviously more complex stuff you can do, but just baseline stuff like having posts on Crypto Giving Tuesday. Um, those nonprofits, generally speaking, don't get any crypto. There's, it's very unlikely that someone would be clicking your donate page and trying to check out with a credit card and go, oh, no, I'll make a non-cash uh, tax offset donation to you instead. It doesn't, it, it doesn't work as a net to have like a passive crypto acceptance tool. Um, so it's a kind of wonky thing to explain, but because we are crypto first, we actually have stock and credit card giving as the secondary components because they're starting with a non-cash asset mentality. They're thinking tax incentive, they're thinking transfer. They understand they're gonna you know, get an appraise and go through this whole process. If that's the, the tip, Sometimes they will back into a credit card, but once they give a credit card, you can then tap them for a non-cash asset later. And then sometimes they'll go to give something like crypto, realize stocks are up more than their crypto, and they'll go to a different non-cash asset instead. Um, so it only kind of works if crypto is the tip of the spear, uh, or you could have stocks as the tip of the spear sometimes as well. And then you can back into you know cash or digital giving options. Anytime you have your regular donation form and you just add crypto as a backup thing. We've never seen that be effective. We're trying to work on it with integration partners to make it a bit more prominent. Um, so long story short, per your question, um, the nonprofits who are actively using it, it tends to be like, uh, when we run it as an average, like 3%, sometimes it's as high as 6% during like peak giving periods of, uh, donation volume, but it very much depends on the size and the strategy. So like you could have one nonprofit who posts once a year that they accept crypto on Twitter and they have two followers on Twitter and they don't have a young donor base and they never engage. And they're just kind of like not a future-proof nonprofit at all. They're just like slowly losing ground and they're not really good at fundraising from younger folks in general. And if they're not, you know, trying to get good at fundraising from younger folks or like really investing in any of those active strategies, you could just have a, a crypto option sitting on a website that generates nothing. And then there's, you know, orangutan outreach, which is like a small 
500,000 a year nonprofit they were when they joined our platform. Like they raised over a million dollars in crypto in one calendar year, but that's, uh, you know, they tripled their budget with crypto, but that's because they were DMing people on Twitter. They had a very active strategy. Their cause was compelling. They were, you know, going to physical in-person events sometimes. Um, it's not like a thing you can pop on a website and just expect a proportion of your volume to come in. So I know that's a kind of a nuanced and less fun answer. Um, but the two questions would be like, how good are you at the internet in a fundamental sense? And how good are you at fundraising? If those two things come together and you care about going out and meeting these people, it, it doesn't take much, you know, Googling a strategy to just integrate it across what you're doing. If you don't have anything there to plug it into, then uh, it, it would probably be um, not a useful thing. If your website's not mobile optimized, then cryptocurrency isn't going to be, you know, a, a silver bullet for you. I wish I had a more fun answer for that. Oh, there's some in the Q&A also. Sorry. Oh, H&W is uh, high net worth um, for that question. Um, and then a little more context on the tax instead of definitely. Um, how is that different or greater than donating stocks or cash? So it's the same uh, tax benefit as stocks in that um, pretty much if I give you a million dollars in stocks, I don't have to pay capital gains tax on that. So like if I have a million dollars in stocks, that million dollars is functionally worth somewhere between 700,000 and close to that million, depending on the price I bought it and the price it's at. If I bought it for a dollar and it's worth a million, I will owe, depending on the state I'm in, somewhere between 20 and 30% probably in state and federal cap gains tax. If I bought it for 900 grand and it's at a million, then I only have 100 grand in appreciation. So I would owe like you know 30,000. Um, somewhere in that range, you have to pay tax on it. So it's, it's worth less than the actual million. The only time it's worth a million to transfer non-cash assets anywhere is when you give them to a nonprofit because a 501c3 doesn't owe taxes and then you don't either, you've given it away. So the larger the transaction any donor is sending you, the more and more incentivized they are to give you an asset instead of their cash because they're functionally making the only part of their portfolio that's not actually worth a million bucks. A million bucks in the bank is worth a million dollars anywhere. But their crypto or their stocks is only worth a million dollars when they give it to you. So that's an amazing incentive. The difference with crypto that's added to that is when you give stocks to a charity or you trigger a taxable event by selling your stocks, you can't buy those same stocks on that same day. It's called a wash rule um, with stocks. With crypto, you can. So that might be something they close at the end of this year, but it's a, an additional incentive. It's still a huge incentive even without it. But the cool part about crypto is if you don't want to lose crypto, right? You don't want to leave the market. You think it's about to go up a bunch. Then you wouldn't want to give away your crypto now. You'd want to wait till it's up. Crypto can be given at any time because they can give you the million dollars in crypto, of Bitcoin, let's say, and they can immediately take the million bucks they have in the bank and they can buy a million dollars worth of Bitcoin right now. The million dollars they gave you, you get the full million, they get the million dollar write off. The million dollars they just bought in Bitcoin, they bought at today's price. So it's not up or down, it's right at today's price. The thing they bought that went up, it's gone, you've got it, they got all the value out of it. And the new crypto they bought, they don't know any taxes at all yet because that appreciation, they just kind of evaporated through the donation. So it's, uniquely powerful in crypto because you can do it at any point in time and just buy more crypto at the exact same time you're giving. Um, so that's a, that's a cool additional benefit. But just the fact that they can transfer stocks and crypto to you and not pay taxes on it is the main value prop. It's the only way they can get the full million in value out of that asset while also getting the write off. So it's pretty cool. Um, one of the best opportunities of the year uh, to market this option to our members. We will touch on that right now in this section. Um, so this slide just pretty much says, uh, make it easy for your team. Don't neglect donor needs. Uh, please, if you are accepting crypto through like your own exchange account or something, you've set up an account that's not with a vendor or partner. Um, please make sure you have folks on your team who understand it uh, just because there's like horror stories. That's the only reason this slide even exists. You know, someone might try to send an NFT to like a dynamic wallet address and it just sets it on fire. They can never recover it. So there's little things, sometimes nonprofits try to do, you know, kind of makeshift a, a thing together. And I'm always just like, it's, it has been done, but please be careful because yeah, for the donor's sake. And then this thing we keep talking about, the active fundraising strategy, which goes to your question here. 
what times of the year matter. Um, so this was our volume of donations over the calendar year last year. Uh, this tends to parallel uh, every other year we have. So like the month of October, for instance, um, we see more donation volume than in the first five months of the year combined, which is pretty staggering. Um, and then November is significantly larger than that. December is even bigger. 30% of all crypto donations we see are happening in the month of December. So October is gigantic. November is bigger. December is huge. You want uh, as much of all three months as humanly possible. Um, so when you're starting to market this to your donors, uh, there's two things that can go on. There's the active fundraising opportunities in Q4, um, most of which are ones that we, we kind of run from scratch. So like our Crypto Giving Tuesday, NF Tuesday, our bag season campaign is what we call our, our crypto annual giving that goes through those, those full three months. We run fundraisers, we have match dollar pools that go live. There are certain days that are tied to kind of holidays in the crypto sector, like the you know, Bitcoin's birthday and all that good stuff. Um, those are great opportunities to just tell a story and have something to talk about. The other piece is your fundraising opportunities. If you are like MDA, one of our clients, when you do your telethon, you of course wanna have a prominent crypto giving opportunity because you never have more eyeballs on you than you do then. Or if you're, let's say, running a, uh, a walks program that's targeted to college age students, of course, the crypto options would be more prominent. Um, and then finally, market dynamics. If there is a uh, huge upward swing in the market, or when we're following a huge upward swing, when it starts to peter off, uh, we'll oftentimes notify our nonprofits is a good time to, especially if you've a rolled of existing crypto donors, ping them and say, hey, this could be a good time to give. And then sometimes if the market is... Uh, right following like a huge crash like earlier in this year we would recommend to our nonprofits to engage like their major donors um and try to get them to promise a donation uh around the time of market recovery so you could do something like hey you give us all this money every year we'd like to expand your giving but we know we want it to be what's best for your bottom line would you be willing to commit to a 10 million dollar crypto transaction when bitcoin uh is back at thirty thousand dollars a unit something like that so Market dynamics in crypto is one component. Your fundraising opportunities is one component. And then crypto fundraising opportunities that you can plug into. You want to be where they are. Um, so I would say those are kind of the three um, uh, areas of opportunity that kind of overlap into a Venn diagram. Uh, okay, jump into the Q&A. We'll keep, we're making good time on this too. We'll have plenty of time. I think we can even uh, let folks open up their mic, if that's cool, Candice, the end of it, we could just talk through a couple things. Yeah. Looks, we got like 35 folks. Um, mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, how is that happening in October? What is causing crypto nations to jump in that month? The campaign? Yes, kind of. Um, it's tough to say how much uh, um, of an influence we have over it. So again, like in terms of active fundraising nonprofits, almost all of those are on our platform. So the month of October is when we release our, uh, our marketing toolkit for end of year. It's when we have nonprofits um, reinvesting in their kind of tinkering on their messaging, their social media platforms, the ads they run. Um, so I think nonprofits get kind of sleepy through the months of August. And maybe in the beginning of the year, uh, they're starting to maybe peter out in terms of like actively engaging. They just kind of like anyone else, you, you can only sustain so much energy. I largely think the reason it starts kicking off in October is because so much of our energy of our now 2000 nonprofits starts going back out online, sending emails to these nonprofits or donors rather. They start the, the re-engagement strategy. I think it's honestly nonprofits asking and asking effectively um, as one of the largest drivers. And then in November, that's when the campaigns kick off. And then December, we have uh, the most campaigns and fundraising opportunities. A lot of our um, institutional partners are doing that in the month of December too, where it's just Oftentimes, honestly, people kind of procrastinating. You have to get the donation in before the tax uh, deadline. So the last 10 days of the year even are really important. We even have notifications that go out to remind donors to whitelist addresses for the nonprofit. Because sometimes you'll have a donor who wants to send a million bucks to a charity, but they have a security feature in their account that won't let them send money to new addresses until they're approved. And that process can take a week as a security measure to make sure no one can get into your account and take something. Um, and because they don't initiate that process early enough, they get blocked from making the transaction and they wait a whole year to do it. And sometimes they don't. So we're, we're very meticulous in the month of December. It's just um, when a lot of donors are making their, their end of year transactions. Um, 
best and easiest way to track the crypto market. Uh, there are great newsletters. It depends on your level of detail. I personally like um, uh, Mazzari, it's called, M-E-S-S-A-R-I. Um, Ryan Selkis from Mazzari is um, uh, one of our investors. And they're just really, really bright on the analytics front if you're like trying to be an investor. If you just want to know um, price movements and what's going on, there are apps you can download on your phone. Like, uh, um, I'm trying to think what mine is. I always have a, a different one. It's not coin tracker, that's a tax software. But if you just Google, uh, you know, you go to the app store and search like crypto uh, price or crypto portfolio app, um, you can just turn on notifications. It'll tell you when there's price movement. It can be a bit much. Um, otherwise, yeah, I would have, you can get a newsletter from any major crypto outlets. There's also something called The Block, which is for more traditional investors who are interested in crypto. They have a newsletter that a lot of folks like. Okay, so this is the like kind of how to talk to these folks. We'll keep this at a super high level. One, every crypto kind of has its own community. Um, you don't need to be an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but nonprofits do see a lot of success when they're like, okay, we've raised this much in Bitcoin or we've raised this much in say Ethereum specifically. And then they share those sorts of messages out um, or like Ethereum donors have passed Bitcoin donors kind of make it a competition type thing. It's very similar to any other type of fundraising strategy. If you can connect with one particular community, it just tends to activate. So some nonprofits just talk about donating crypto, but someone like um, the American Cancer Society, we once gave everyone a post when we added Dogecoin, which is kind of like a meme that the crypto community was really fired up about for a little while. Uh, and our nonprofits announced like, hey, we accept Doge now, just we add it as an option in the widget. That tweet was their second best performing social post ever. Uh, outside of a celebrity death announcement. I think I had 12,000 retweets or something. Um, so just staying in touch with like what the community is interested in and uh, talking about one crypto versus another and getting one community activated. Those folks um, tend to do quite well. And there are some nonprofits who honestly work with, you know, the 15th largest uh, cryptocurrency. They've met one of those founders. They go on those groups. They have a discord. Like it depends on how deep you want to go, but knowing there are different crypto communities. Um, and seeing which ones kind of align with y'all or are um, uh, active at any point in time is a helpful way to keep your, your content engaging. Uh, two, tax education. If you go out there and you just keep asking people to send you crypto or like donate crypto to you, uh, it will often fall on deaf ears. You have to do uh, a good job of integrating the tax messaging, like reminding folks that they, it's better for your bottom line. And it's like generosity that we as an organization need. Um, there's just a lot of young folks out there who love that you're taking crypto might give you a little bit of cash instead. And otherwise maybe would send you 10K as a tax offset if they really understood that tax incentive. Taking it upon yourself to, you know, put together an infographic every now and then or incorporate it in your messaging, putting in your major gifts call to action. We send out an email for the end of the year. Uh, nonprofits who take a little bit of time to invest in that. Um, it, it's, a, it's a worthwhile cause. And you might have some young donors who just don't know about it with stocks and stuff, right? It's not just crypto. If you accept any type of assets, it's really good to get emails out to your folks and go, you guys should know that this exists because you might have a major gift donor that um, has been giving you 10 bucks a month because of a walk program uh, that you otherwise wouldn't be able to upgrade. So it's, it's important for nonprofits in general, I think, to get in the habit. Um, be someone worth staying in touch with. Again, I can't tell you how many, it tends to be smaller nonprofits. Um, but other nonprofits do this as well, where they will use social media to ask for money. And like their core metric is if I post five times, how much money have they sent me? The, the number one thing you should be trying to accomplish with your social and with your digital presence kind of in general is be someone worth staying in touch with. Like if you're sharing videos that people want to watch, if they're getting updates from you on the impact, if, if there's something that's worth following instead of worth liking or sending 10 bucks, over time that pays off much more significantly. So the nonprofits who played the long game and you know, set a crypto specific goal, post about a crypto specific milestone, share a thank you that's crypto specific, here's how much was given to each of these cryptos, you're sharing value and information. Those nonprofits tend to raise more than the nonprofit who once a month goes, hey, did you know you can send us money using Bitcoin? Um, kind of tapping the screen, like why isn't this working? So. That's again, kind of generalized social strategy, but important for crypto. Um, and this is a Saturday Night Live reference that hopefully Candace gets, maybe others on the, the call, but um, 
crypto donors are their own thing. So you want to steward them differently. The example we give is a Tory from Save the Children. That was the first organization who actually just separated in their CRM if someone gave crypto versus not. Um, and as a result of that, even when someone gave them a dollar in cryptocurrency, they would hit them with a major gift appeal. Uh, the reason being, if they give you a dollar using Bitcoin, that's probably not their giving capacity. It's just kind of a high five. Oh, cool, you take Bitcoin. I like that stuff too. It's a great indicator that they might be someone who at some point will make that major gift as a tax offset, but they were just kind of giving you a drive by, oh, that's awesome. Um, it shouldn't be seen as an indicator of like how much they actually want to give you because the actual crypto gift should be a transaction that is more major. And that means they might have to go back to an advisor, calculate for their accountant, figure some stuff out. Um, those first kind of high five or dust transactions uh, need to be accounted for differently or else they'll go into your CRM. It'll show that they gave five bucks and they'll get an email once a year that says, hey, you want to give us 10 bucks a month, which can be uh, a wasted opportunity. And then we, um, I'll just do this at a really high level because we kind of already hit on these. The American Cancer Society one is the only one. Um, I guess that's, we, we didn't cover fully. What they did is great for all the nonprofits who are listening right now. We're like, this sounds like a lot. I have a lot of things I need to figure out. Not necessarily. Uh, what the American Cancer Society did with the Cancer Crypto Fund that we put together with them is they just made space for crypto users. They don't speak a crazy different language. They're not trying to plug in with discords and getting really good at Reddit and like going to conferences necessarily. Like they had a $10 million fundraising goal for a research project that was already happening. And they took a million dollars out of that goal and they set it in crypto specifically. They go, we're gonna raise one out of these $10 million in crypto. Um, and we're gonna call it the Cancer Crypto Fund. We're gonna put crypto donor names on here who give above a certain level in crypto. If they wanna be there. We'll let companies from the crypto community specifically sponsor it. And they'll go on this page the same way they did for the general fundraising page. And then on social, every third, fourth post, um, whatever, however many that it fits in, they would post about the crypto specific goal and the crypto specific milestones. And when they hit their $10 million goal and the million dollar goal that they raised in crypto specifically, they just reported out on that. They were like, we raised a million dollars in crypto in the same way they released their 10 million report. Here's where that crypto is going. Here are the cryptocurrencies that we raised and at what levels. Here's why that crypto is so impactful. They're literally doing the same thing they're doing across their regular fundraising, just making space for crypto users specifically without reinventing the wheel. It, it didn't take a ton of time. They just kind of copied and pasted a campaign and made it crypto specific. And it was extraordinarily effective. Um, it's really just the difference between passively popping a crypto option on your website and trying to go out and meet these people and give them space that's just for them. Um, they did a phenomenal job of it. There are a lot of nonprofits who want to, you know, go to crypto conferences right off the bat or like make their own NFTs. Some of that stuff can be effective and fun, but it, it's it's highly time consuming and, and a lot to learn all at once. And I know nonprofits are concerned about that. They're a great example of someone who just did what they were doing and popped the word crypto into a lot of those sentences. Gave it its own landing page, talked about it on social, and it was super effective. Nonprofits are kind of afraid to figure out a whole new thing. You really don't have to. It's just having the, uh, you know, the, the intrinsic motivation to want to make a space that it is for them and to continually engage. They didn't do it for like a month and give up. They did it over an extended period of time. Now they're years into building a crypto revenue channel and they're just sprinkling a little crypto in every now and then without kind of falling asleep at the wheel. So, um, Awesome job by them, honestly, in general. It, it took very little time and they really didn't overextend, even though they were all very excited about crypto. They kept it very, very simple. Um, yeah, and then how we build our plans, we do our end of year toolkit, which we released recently to our clients, um, which is just like end-to-end -end with, with templates for how they build out all of the kits and then kind of a, a walkthrough of the campaign calendar and how to plug into everything uh, for emails and, and press release, all that good stuff. And then uh, complete your checklist. We have our checklist, but in general, let's say you're not even working with us. Um, this is just like a general nonprofit fundraising guidance. Um, make sure your donation page is good. Make sure you have a social media plan um, that plugs into all of the key opportunities. And then the kind of major gifts appeal or existing donor base appeal, make sure you're getting an email uh, out to your existing clients that's like, hey, we take crypto. Here's the tax incentive. If you'd like to support us uh, in this method, please. Uh, make sure to, to do so or get in touch. Um, and then there's a lot of other things you can, of course, do, but those are kind of the, the foundational 
components. All right, nice. I'm going to blow through this too so we can talk to folks and answer questions. But this is just kind of um, how our stuff works uh, quickly down the right side of this. Um, what cryptos, or, or left side rather, what cryptos should you accept? How do we sell it, et cetera? The solution solves for all of that. The cryptos that are accepted are what's listed on exchange, very similar like a Fidelity, but for crypto. And it's automatically sold using a program that we plug in. Um, how do donors get it appraised? We have a network of appraisers for when donors ask, but it's very rare that the donor needs you for that. They usually find their own appraiser and just get that done. Price volatility, again, not an issue because you should have a, a solution that's automatically converting it to cash and just ACH and you the money. Um, how do we receive the donors? Again, those are automated. Um, accepting NFTs can be a question. None of our nonprofits accept those directly. We have a DAF as a third party partner who accepts those. Um, and it's the exact same structure, but it's just without 2000 nonprofits updating their gift acceptance policy. So we just do that through a third party. Um, and then is it safe to accept? Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. So long as you're, you're doing it the right way, very similar to, to stocks and other stuff they report to um, all the same kind of regulators. Um, yeah, this is the widget that most donors give through that automates all the stuff we just touched on. A lot of our nonprofits use. Um, we're the main builder of integrations into uh, nonprofit CRMs and then nonprofit payment solutions as well. Um, as well as like partnering with uh, a lot of the um, fundraising firms in the space to integrate crypto into capital campaigns that appeals. Uh, we accept cards and stocks that are going live on the platform, which we were talking about kind of the tip of the spear. We have a lot of folks who come through us and then through Ren and other DAF partners we have have been sending stocks. So we're just gonna make it built into the widget. They can give other types of non-cash as we run these really active non-cash campaign appeals for crypto. It's just a lot of overlap on that young investor community in particular. And then the card thing is largely just to capture, honestly, people who are not tax literate. I can't tell you how many people come to our site during these campaigns and you get you know hundreds of thousands of people pouring through. A lot of them just don't know about the tax center, no matter how much we hit it, or maybe they're you know reading it wrong. So they wanna make sure they can give 10 bucks on a card and we can have nonprofits from their crypto solution. Look at that at the end of the year, go, hey, these 80 folks who gave us 10 bucks on a credit card, they're here because we're talking about Bitcoin. So we're going to try to give them a little more tax education, see if we can reel in some bigger gifts. And then the institutional arm that I talked about with uh, DAF partners, this is for all the small stuff. If anyone ever wants to send you a crypto that we don't have in the widget, um, they want to give you an NFT directly. They want to give stock in some complex way or through a vehicle, um, you know, like a trust. We have Mike Klein, who adds up our institutional team. So all of those fringe cases that nonprofits have historically had to bake into their solution or update their gift acceptance policy, we have one arm that handles that, you know, two percent of things that can happen, so that we don't need to have a universal solution um, that every nonprofit needs to be accommodating everything because it can become a pain. So we keep the ninety-eight percent of donations coming through a really simple process for donors and nonprofits, and rather than integrating the other stuff, we have an institutional arm that can handle that. Also, sometimes someone wants to send. You know, $30 million in Bitcoin, and they would just like to have somebody on the phone. Um, and then, yeah, a dashboard um, where nonprofits get their data all in one place. Um, and I'll skip through because we, we hit on these summary items and just run through the overview again. Uh, don't wait till December to start accepting crypto. You're probably not going to reach a lot of folks. Um, again, you, not every nonprofit needs to accept crypto, like right now or in this calendar year, but explore the opportunity to do so. I know Candace was dropping the link, um, but if you go to thegivingblock.com, there's an accept crypto button. You just get on the phone with someone who runs you through the product stack and you can get a, a document that tells you what you can do if you want to plug in with us. Um, I would do that earlier rather than later, but again, you might be a small nonprofit. It's not for you this year, totally fine, but definitely look into it earlier rather than later. You're not going to be able to join you know, Crypto Giving Tuesday the day before. Um, consistently remind your donors that you take crypto. You don't have to do crypto specific emails, but you should be sprinkling it in your stuff as much as you can. It gets a lot of engagement. It's good for younger folks to see. Um, and it's just the consistency of the appeals that ultimately starts pulling them out of the woodwork. Uh, take the fundraising day seriously because they are the, the largest mass activation on the donor side. Uh, and then don't skip the, uh, the fundamentals. Make sure that your donation page is search engine optimized. Anyone who's on this call now, if you search donate Bitcoin kids or you know, donate crypto animals, you'll see 
you know, half a dozen nonprofits sometimes that are our clients coming up before even our platform, which is the main place people go to get crypto because you rank really well for kids or for animals, whatever it might be. So pairing that crypto content with your mission-based content on your donate crypto page, super key, because again, like we said, a lot of people are Googling, where can I donate my Bitcoin, my crypto, et cetera. Um, if they're talking about your cause, you'd like to show up on the, the internet, it's valuable real estate. And then don't stop in January. A lot of our nonprofits get real fired up. They get puffed through December. They talk to a lot of donors and then they just stop for a while. And then all those donors end up giving somewhere else, which can be frustrating. It's, it's you know, use it or lose it. Um, is a good way to summarize it. And with that, we have five minutes. I thought we'd have more. I talked too much. Um, and I will now turn back to open up for questions. Oh, CTA is a call to action. Um, uh, is stocks and cards with Simplify our package? The answer is yes. Uh, to Adri Adrian, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, uh, cards and stocks are going to get pushed live for all clients. You don't have to turn them on if you don't want. It could be an off switch. I don't know why folks wouldn't uh, want it as a backup option for donors, but we're going to push it live across the, the tech stack regardless of nonprofits package levels. Okay, good. Adrian. Um, Thanks so much, Pat. This was awesome. I feel like yeah. every time I hear you talk, I learn something new about um, how powerful crypto is as um, a fundraising opportunity. And I think it is like, like you were saying something that really can future proof organizations and yeah, I, the more people that get started now, the better, um, you know, so I just encourage everyone to book that demo with the giving block so that you can learn a little bit more about like what this would actually look like for your organization. So, um, Pat, it's a delight to have you here. I wanted to open it up because I know we wanted to have this be like the opportunity for people to come on screen as well. So if you don't want to come on screen and have more questions, put them in the chat, put them in the Q and a pane, we'll hang out for a few more minutes. Um, but yeah, for anyone that does want to come on screen, you can raise your hands and we can chat. So we would love to invite you um, to engage with us. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, there's been so much great engagement um, in the chat. I, I know it's a little bit smaller today, but I think uh, everyone here has been so engaged and so um uh, present. So thanks for, thanks for coming. I don't know if folks are able to, are they able to raise hands? They should be able to raise hands. Maybe not, they still wanna. but if anyone wants to, you can just write in the chat as well. We're going to hang out for a couple more minutes, but, um, Pat, any like final thoughts on, like what nonprofits really should be doing right now as like a next step to, to getting started with um, yeah. fundraising with crypto. Yeah, I think I saw a hand raised too. I'm not sure who's just went up, but it went off and on. Um, but the best, like in summary, um, it is, it, even if you're not taking stocks, right? It's critically important that nonprofits uh, accept non-cash assets and then like actively promote the opportunity to give those to their user base, especially younger donors. Um, it's pretty wild how uncommon it is for, for donors in general to be aware of it and how much more they can give on average because of it. Everyone's got some assets in some way, shape or form, um, making it easy for them to donate it and then like actively promoting those opportunities consistently. Um, a lot of these younger folks who are giving 10 bucks a month to a charity could be major gift donors. And they're just not because the nonprofit um, tools to accept it are not designed for young donors. Some nonprofits still have like a stock donation process where you gotta like get on the phone and like fax stuff um, mm -hmm. or don't accept crypto and this other stuff at all. Like you, you, you really should be, again, unless you're very small and it, it's kind of a distraction for you for the time being, you should be enabled to accept non-cash assets in a way that's like really easy for young people in specific or in particular. Um, and you need to effectively uh, promote it as part of it. If you're just adding non-cash assets as like a backup option on a donation page that starts with credit cards, it's never been uh, effective for the clients we work with. So I would say um, 
figuring that out as quickly as possible in, you know, in order of other things that are important to you want a good website, you want to have a good social strategy, the asset types that you can accept and how easy it is for young folks in particular should be a part of your innovation plan and, and should be on every nonprofit's mind. Um, the, you, you shouldn't be waiting to figure out kind of what you need and, and when you should have it. Yeah. Um, this is just like a huge opportunity. Like, why not? <laughs> right. <laughs> I just feel like, well, yeah. why, why not have, have that option and, and start exploring? Because I think like, especially year end is a great time to like start testing um, these, these opportunities and, and tapping into this as well. So, um, awesome. There's actually yeah. a couple more questions. Um, George asked, asked, is there a problem sharing potential tax advice? How do we word it without seeming like instruction? Yeah. Um, you shouldn't be just like doing that solo unless you're like pretty familiar with it. Um, so yeah, so like you can definitely do that wrong. Very similar to like asking for crypto, like you could be like telling people to buy crypto because a partner asked you to do something weird. Like there's things you can do that are incorrect and, and not acceptable. Um, tax is the same thing. If you're telling everyone like this is always what happens when you give this way, like you you want to make sure that the, the uh, language you're using is actually, I mean, not only effective, but compliant. Um, so if, if you're a, a client of ours, George, just like ping us, you can like support at thegivingblock.com. You can you ping us and ask questions. Um, and then like, if not, whoever you're working with, or, you know, you've probably got advisors or other folks you can talk to, the CPA that you work with as an organization, um, make sure, yeah, that tax instructions are, are clear and you're, you're talking about in which jurisdiction and under which circumstances, um, you know, using words like may, for instance. Um, and then the other uh, question here, I know as we butt up against time, is from Donna, when we promote donating crypto, do we need to tell them of a portal for them to do so? or they just contact the development director who has a way to make the transfer. Uh, I can't imagine, I, when we were doing this in 2018, some nonprofits were still doing that, where it's like, we can accept crypto, contact us if you want to. I can't imagine uh, people would do that. Like one of the big points of crypto is it's so much easier to give than even with a credit card. Like they can send you $100,000 in seconds. Um, if the way for them to give crypto is to like contact someone and start like an email exchange, I don't think they would probably do it. If they're giving like 10 million bucks, especially if they're an older person, I'm sure they still would. Um, but for the vast majority of crypto transactions, then yes, like, like our product, our core product is a widget. Um, but however you take crypto, it, it probably shouldn't be, here's our development director's email, contact us. That would be like, if you imagine you have a newsletter, right? You're like, how do we sign up? It's like, send us an email and, and jump on a call with us and we'll enter you into a database. People would be like, I don't, I don't want this newsletter. <laughs> um, it's like any <laughs> other donation too. Like, I mean, I know for me, if I'm going to make a donation and it takes more than a couple of clicks, I'm like probably going to be out. <laughs> yeah. In crypto in particular, it's like gotten, yeah, I'm that way with mobile sites now. It's gotten pretty staggering. Yeah. If I'm on a nonprofit site, it's at all like hard to find a button or the form has a couple fields too many, like the, the drop rates when we like, when we run numbers on it, or even just my personal experience, like I'll stop doing something quickly. I dropped a, a life insurance policy recently because they, they said I had to like call to do something and like go through a process. They were like mail me paperwork. I was like, I'm, I'm done with this. Um, they just, I couldn't do it all digitally. So I just dropped it entirely. I'm going to start it over with someone who doesn't make me do that. I think donating will catch up very quickly. The, the rate of change for how easy it is to transfer money to a nonprofit is going to adapt very quickly, just like in other markets. It is a pain as a provider, though, because you, you got to keep updating everything so quickly. Yeah, it just has to be like always optimized. But I do think a little optimization goes a long way um, because like whatever you're doing now, if, whether it's like accepting crypto and making that super easy in a couple of clicks or just like optimizing your donation page by removing just a couple of form fields, you could increase conversion rates 50%. So boom, 50% more donations through your site. So really yeah. like big opportunity there, I think. hundred percent. Same thing with your content being effective and engaging. Yeah. Now, Robert's asked that all the time too. Like, if I like get started with Twitter or whatever, like, how well will I do? It's just like, are you cool? 
<laughs> like almost the question where it's just like are you fun it's like how do i yeah how do i successfully fundraise on social it's like why are some influencers more popular than others do you know what i mean it almost comes down to like charisma and like the efficiency of language if you put something in bullet points versus paragraph form like the data changes dramatically so all of that fine tuning i think it's just getting more important it becomes easier and easier to, to consume information Definitely. Um, I know we're over time, so I want to be cautious of oh, yeah. you know things that you need to get to. Um, Donna actually did ask if you can show an ex a sample of how your widget works. If you have time, if not, yeah. happy to point her to um, a place for her to explore more. I'll do it. Yeah, I can do it real quick. I am. If it's okay, it's an internal meeting. Um, so this is our website. It's the same uh, widget here that you'll see on on any of our client sites. Um, so any number of, we'll, I'll just do JDRF, um, but in a profit on our platform, you'll see this widget. It's the same widget that goes on, uh, any client site. You pick the crypto you want to give, um, doesn't matter which one it is. You can donate via, uh, crypto and you can calculate whether the crypto units, you know, let's say a hundred units of Ethereum, which should be 130,000. Um, Continue. We have the option to donate anonymously. This is something a nonprofit can turn on or off. You don't have to accept anonymous gifts. A lot of nonprofits feel comfortable doing it because, again, we have an exchange partner that screens transactions. Um, so I'll just skip the form for the sake of the example. Um, if you want to get a receipt, we give them a secondary prompt to be like, hey, you won't have a receipt. Um, if you don't give us any email for the obvious reason that we can't provide it to you, we don't know who you are. Uh, I'll skip that, but generally speaking, even anonymous donors will enter just the, the one time use email for a receipt. And they'll literally copy this like a, a account address, like if you were sending a wire. And then usually they'll have kind of like an in browser wallet attachment, or they'll just go to their exchange account and they'll enter the units and click send. So it's completely agnostic. They can send it from any account type they'd like. Um, they just pull a wallet address and, and send it to the non or, uh, Nonprofit. They get an automatic tax receipt. Nonprofit gets an automatic uh, uh, notification if they want that. The data gets reconciled between the form and the transaction details in our dashboard. And that's it. Everything else is just how you want to steward that donor based on the info they provide. And if the donor has any additional questions for like an appraisal, or whatever else it is, um, nonprofits just forward that to us. We connect them with the right folks. Awesome. Thank you so much, yeah. Pat super easy I, it's kind of great seeing it in action so hopefully uh that helps um everyone out get more practical ideas about how your nonprofit can really easily like you just saw start accepting crypto um and i do think your end is a huge opportunity for you um and yeah pat it was wonderful having you so thanks for hanging out with us on a friday i know it's uh end of the week <laughs> and yeah, everyone, thanks so much for having me coming out on a Friday. So, uh, yeah. all right, well, I'll let you get to your meeting and thank you everyone um, for being here. Have a good weekend. Enjoy Thanks, when everybody. we were young, when we were young. <laughs> I will. Thanks. You have a good weekend too. Bye everyone. Take care.